Developing now, Trump dominates. Well, thank you very much. They uh, call it Super Tuesday for a reason. This is a big one. Super Tuesday results coming in overnight, showing the former president on a powerful path to the Republican nomination. Border debacle. Will President Biden publicly address Lake and Riley's murder, allegedly at the hands of an illegal immigrant who was released by law enforcement multiple times on Thursday night? The Biden administration on the defense as more voters say immigration is their top concern this election year. More spending. Because of high inflation, their budgets are already stressed. Some of them are even turning to credit card debt to, to absorb the impact of those higher prices. As Americans battle rising prices, Congress is set to vote on a $450 billion spending package to fund the government. And Fulton County fallout. More witnesses step up to testify over the affair and financial transactions between Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade. And we do start with breaking news this morning. Nikki Haley set to drop out of the presidential race. This development does come after former President Donald Trump took a victory lap after a major show of voter support on Super Tuesday. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jan Jeffcoat. It is Wednesday, March 6th. The big announcement with Haley dropping out now coming after Republican voters sent a clear message on who they want in the White House. Last night, Trump won all the states that she see right here in red, losing only Vermont to Nikki Haley. Exit polls also found the top issue driving voters was immigration at 44%, the most important issue in North Carolina, in fact, and Virginia, followed by the economy at 28%. We do have team coverage with Luli Ortiz at Trump's Mar-a-Lago Resort in Florida, Angela Brown at the live desk breaking down Super Tuesday results, and we do start with Angela and those breaking developments about Nikki Haley ending her run at the live desk. Good morning to you. And good morning to you, Jen. Yeah, that announcement is supposed to happen sometime around 10 a.m. this morning in her home state of South Carolina. Of course, we're going to watch for that. Now, this comes after former President Donald Trump dominated Super Tuesday. The former president more than doubled his delegate count. Here he is at Mar-a-Lago right here. Coming out to chants of USA, Trump addressing a crowd of supporters here. I want you to take a listen to what he told these folks. Our cities are choking to death, our states are dying, and frankly, our country is dying, and we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before. And the former president did not mention Nikki Haley in that speech, the only other Republican left in the race right now. Although, once again, we're hearing those reports from the Wall Street Journal of the places that she plans to end her campaign today. We'll hear more about that in her announcement coming up at 10 a.m. Last night, though, her campaign released this statement right here. Today, in state after state, there remains a large block of Republican primary voters who are expressing deep concerns about Donald Trump. That is not the unity our party needs for success. Addressing those voters' concerns will make the Republican Party and America better. At the same time, President Biden also dominated on Super Tuesday news. And we want to break into programming briefly with some new developments in the race for president. You see her right there. We want to take you to Charleston, South Carolina, where Nikki Haley is addressing her future right now. Let's listen in. Just over a year ago, I launched my campaign for president. When I began, I said the campaign was grounded in my love for our country. Just last week, my mother, a first-generation immigrant, got to vote for her daughter for president. Only in America. I am filled with the gratitude for the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. And although I will no longer be a candidate, I will not stop using my voice for the things I believe in. Our national debt will eventually crush our economy. A smaller federal government is not only necessary for our freedom, it is necessary for our survival. The road to socialism is the road to ruin for America. Our Congress is dysfunctional and only getting worse. It is filled with followers, not leaders. Term limits for Washington politicians are needed now more than ever. Our world is on fire, 
because of America's retreat. Standing by our allies in Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan is a moral imperative. But it's also more than that. If we retreat further, there will be more war, not less. As important, while we stand strong for the cause of freedom, we must bind together as Americans. We must turn away from the darkness of hatred and division. I will continue to promote all those values, as is the right of every American. I sought the honor of being your president. But in our great country, being a private citizen is privilege enough in itself. And that's a privilege I very much look forward to enjoying. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. I wish anyone well who would be America's president. Our country is too precious to let our differences divide us. I have always been a conservative Republican and always supported the Republican nominee. But on this question, as she did on so many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd, always make up your own mind. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his time for choosing. I end my campaign with the same words I began it from the book of Joshua. I direct them to all Americans, but especially to so many of the women and girls out there who put their faith in our campaign. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For God will be with you wherever you go. In this campaign, I have seen our country's greatness from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, America. God bless you. And you've been listening to Nikki Haley, who again announced she is officially dropping out of the race for president. For months, Haley has stayed in the race. She's fought long and hard, but failed to get any traction to compete against Donald Trump, who overwhelmingly has won every primary state so far except two, meaning we are likely headed for a rematch of 2020 with Trump and Biden. We've got all the latest developments online at thenationaldesk.com. We now return you to the National Desk, already in progress. Then it goes to the Senate, uh, where it requires 60 votes just to pass. If not, there's a possibility of a government shutdown, but there's a stopgap measure already in place to buy more time for negotiations. Thank you so much, Angela. A shakeup in a high-profile Senate race developing right now. Democrat-turned-independent Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema says she will retire at the end of this year. She was running against Republican Carrie Lake and Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego for the seat. Democratic Senator Bob Menendez Mendez facing new criminal charges related to a years-long bribery scheme involving the Qatari government. The 18-count indictment charging the New Jersey lawmaker with obstruction of justice for attempting to cover up bribe payments. He has denied any wrongdoing. And now to an update out of Georgia where defense lawyers want to hear from a new witness in the effort to have DA Fonnie Willis removed from the 2020 election interference case. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins joining us live from Capitol Hill. Good morning to you, Kayla. Will this witness make a difference? Well, good morning, Jan. So that's unclear. Closing arguments in this case already happened. This new witness is a Cobb County prosecutor named Cindy Lee Yeager, and she was reportedly concerned when watching the testimony of Wade's former business partner, Terrence Bradley. In these court documents, uh, she said that what Bradley said on the stand didn't match up with the conversations that they reportedly had in person. When Bradley told her multiple times that Wade and Willis began dating in 2019, that's well before she appointed him, and the timeline of this romantic relationship between Wade and Willis is crucial to the push to have Willis removed as the prosecutor for the Georgia election interference case against Trump and his co-defendants. Gossip versus what you're willing to say under oath uh, are two radically different things. What you say under oath and therefore might be perjuring yourself, you're going to be much more careful than what you say in a text message to a colleague or a friend. 
During closing arguments last Friday, the judge said he hoped to rule in the next two weeks. Meanwhile, a Georgia State Senate committee subpoenaed defense attorney Ashley Merchant, who uncovered the possible ethical violations. They want her testimony in their own investigation into Fonnie Willis. Live on Capitol Hill, I'm Gail Gaskins reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. And in Colorado, Republican lawmakers now threatening Secretary of State Jenna Griswold with a recall effort. This comes after the Supreme Court struck down the state's attempt to remove former President Trump from the primary election. The Colorado lawmakers slamming Griswold writing, your attempt to disenfranchise millions of Coloradans and prevent them from exercising their right to cast a vote in support of President Donald J. Trump is a stain on our republic and an outright embarrassment to Coloradans and Americans. Over 600,000 signatures in 60 days is needed to force a recall election. Ahead this morning, Digital Division, new warnings that China is using the TikTok platform to divide Americans. And not informed, new allegations that a group pushing for gender treatments in children hid side effects from patients. And here at the live desk, we're taking a live look at the national desk radar right here behind me as a storm heads east, putting a damper on spring break plans for millions. The details coming up in 90 seconds. And a live look at the National Desk Radar as we watch a system swirling over parts of the South, washing out plans for millions of spring breakers who are headed to the beach this weekend. The multi-day event is expected to impact about 17 million people from Texas to Central and Southern Florida. Taking a closer look at conditions in Florida right now, bracing for several rounds of a storm. Only a few inches of rain are expected in the first round, though, bringing some marginal risks. For, but forecasters say the second will likely be more serious in this case. Now, we're going to give you a live, live look over Dayton, Ohio this morning. Right behind me, it looks a little foggy there, where a cleanup is underway in Lipsick after a tornado was spotted on Tuesday afternoon causing damage to at least one home. Another live look for you this morning. Uh, this time we're going to take you over Boston, Massachusetts as the Northeast prepares to get hit with a slow moving system expected to bring several inches of rain from this afternoon through Thursday. Now we're on top of all the major weather events happening across the country. Updates as they happen right here at the live desk and online all the time at the National Weather Desk, part of the nationaldesk.com. Thank you so much, Angela. The Super Tuesday primary results also revealing concerns over the migrant crisis as some networks mocked and made fun of the 44% of voters who revealed an exit polling calling immigration their top concern. I mean, if you look at some of these exit polls, I mean, I live in Virginia. Immigration was the number one issue. <laughs> yes. I mean, again, these could change in, in Virginia. Well, Virginia does have a border with West Virginia. <laughs> very, very contested but you're area. Build the wall. Like, what? President Biden expected to address the migrant crisis during the State of the Union address tomorrow. That's going to be at 9 p.m. again, Eastern Time tomorrow. The Biden administration now finding itself on the defense as it is getting hit with more questions about the president's migrant policies. We know what President Biden said about inviting people in. We know that he got rid of all the things that were keeping the border closed that President Trump had put in. We know that he got rid of all those. So when you say it's not his well, fault, that's, not, when that's he does, literally not true. It's literally not what, true what that he got rid of the Did you see 7.2 separation? Did you see 7.2 million people come in yeah, it, it, during the Trump administration? This increased scrutiny coming after a new report from the Center for Immigration Studies showed the Biden administration flew 320,000 illegal migrants from their home countries to the U.S. through a controversial program using the CBP-1 app. Last year, those migrants arrived at 43 undisclosed U.S. airports. Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders wrote, Biden has been secretly flying illegal immigrants into the country. This administration operates in secret and has been lying to the American people about their disastrous border policy. Virginia Congressman Ben Klein wrote, while America slept, the Biden administration covertly relocated thousands of migrants into our cities, blatantly ignoring immigration laws. Taxpayer dollars are being spent on secret flights and misuse of CBP resources. And we continue to see more cases of illegal migrants charged in serious crimes. The U.S. Marshals arrested Venezuelan national and cartel member Aldevis Rodriguez for murder. 
Investigators say he shot and killed a woman during a drive-by shooting in Chicago on Sunday. And in Washington State, an illegal migrant from Mexico has been arrested, accused of killing a state trooper. 33-year-old Raul Santana has been charged with vehicular homicide. Investigators say he struck and killed 27-year-old trooper Christopher Gadd on Saturday. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs getting backlash for vetoing a bill that would have allowed police to arrest migrants who crossed the border illegally. Republican Senate candidate Carrie Lake wrote, following the savage murder of Lake and Riley by an illegal immigrant, the Arizona Senate GOP put forward a bill to protect Arizonans from the tragedies that come with an open border. But the DNC doesn't want this to stop. Katie Hobbs' veto of the Arizona Border Invasion Act is yet another slap in the face to Arizonans. A cyber alert for you this morning. House lawmakers now going after TikTok's parent company over national security concerns. The bipartisan bill would make it illegal for app stores or web hosting service providers to distribute apps controlled by ByteDance, the Chinese company currently under CCP control. And this also comes as lawmakers are raising new concerns about the national security risks from TikTok. The National Desk's Christine Frizzell reports. Today I made easily the most expensive plate of pasta I've ever made. It's a platform that seems to offer something for everyone. Delicious delivery. But concerns in Washington are accelerating rapidly. If I can really do magic, look, look, three, two, one. Not about magic or makeup, but about manipulation, since TikTok is owned by a Chinese company. They believe that this medium is the gateway to sort of picking the lock uh, to getting access to young people and persuading the way that they view the world. Author Peter Schweitzer details evidence of China's campaign of influence in his new book, Blood Money, a chief strategy magnifying existing divisions in the United States. They create thousands, if not millions, of fake media accounts uh, on social media in the United States posing as Americans. Half of them essentially say America's a racist society. The other half say, I only like white people. One third of adults under 30 now report they regularly get their news from TikTok, up from 9% in 2020, perhaps a key factor in President Biden setting up an account. You got to take a look at the other guy. He's about as old as I am. Despite calling it a national security threat. To allow a company uh, that is owned by ByteDance, which is beholden to the Chinese Communist Party, to be the dominant news platform for the next generation of Americans, I think, I think borders on, on national suicide. Top officials with ByteDance deny it's collecting data on Americans, but most lawmakers don't buy it, with a threat to ban TikTok if it's not sold to an American company. Still, there is no legislation ready to be passed, despite bipartisan agreement about the threat it poses. We would never have allowed CBS, ABC, NBC to be owned by the Soviet Union in the 1960s. Yeah. And that is, I think, if anything, understating the degree of influence that we are seeding right now. Alarm bells from lawmakers. The campaign of influence is already being carried out on a platform they worry may be too big and too popular to rein in. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton taking a stand against President Biden's aggressive electric vehicle push. Senator Cotton introduced a bill barring rental car companies from forcing customers to drive EVs unless they explicitly opt for them. He argues rental car companies should not, quote, advance Democrats' radical climate agenda, adding that policies that force EVs on Americans who either don't want or can't afford them are unfair. And he writes our legislation will prevent these companies from taking Taking advantage of consumers. And breaking right here at the live desk, Israel striking back against Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon. And they continue talks to secure the release of dozens of hostages. Details on all that coming up 90 seconds. Brand new video just into the live desk as Israel bombards Hezbollah targets, eliminating terrorists who participated in the October 7th massacre and apprehending weapons in Khan Yunus and Gaza. The strikes are in retaliation to the terror group's attack on Tuesday, where they launched more than 30 missiles into Israel. Ten were intercepted by the Iron Dome. So far, no fatalities have been reported. That attack comes as an American envoy is in Cairo right now to help broker a hostage release and ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas. Those talks have been extended after already two days of no breakthrough. And here uh, we have an opportunity for an immediate ceasefire that can bring hostages home, 
that can dramatically increase the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Palestinians who so desperately need it, and can also set the conditions for an enduring resolution. And it is on Hamas to make decisions about whether it is prepared to engage in that ceasefire. Well, if that deal is finalized, dozens of Israeli hostages would be freed and a 40-day truce would allow aid to make its way into Gaza. Officials are hoping for a deal now before the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, which starts next week. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health under fire accused of supporting unethical medical procedures on minors. A new report by Environmental Progress claims the nonprofit advocated for arbitrary medical strategies that were politically driven instead of science based. It claims the organization supported painful life altering operations on children and patients with mental illnesses who could not comprehend the procedures effects. But I think the most serious consequence is just that many of the children, adolescents, and vulnerable adults, as well as their parents, do not understand the consequences of these treatments. And we see the WPATH practitioners, the gender-affirming care practitioners, describing how they know that they're not getting informed consent. And that's a huge no-no when it comes to medicine. And that was... President of the group, Michael Schellenberger, who said WPATH knew about unintended consequences of those treatments. The Parental Bill of Rights is on its way to become law in Washington State. The state legislature passed the initiative yesterday. It would allow parents with children in public schools to review their curriculum as well as medical records and opt out of any assignments involving sexual ideology or questioning their religious or political beliefs. Ahead in our next half hour, priced out, sky high mortgage rates and surging inflation driving homeowners out of the housing market. Also, migrant landings, border agents reporting a rise in illegal immigrants attempting to enter the U.S. on boats. Also, have a check your top stories coming up next. First, though, here's a look at America's news and weather now, where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look the Northeast. We have a warm day in the Northeast. Today, temps are going to surge back into the 50s with a narrow window of sun. There will be some rain over northern New England and parts of New York. Here we are, 7 a.m. Notice that narrow window of sun is uh, closing in during the course of the afternoon. More rain moves in late today through tonight. Flood watches have been issued through southern New England. We should be clearing it out on Thursday. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Bailey. Here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. Tuesday has been fairly wet and Wednesday will be the same. We'll have scattered showers, especially as we move through the afternoon. And then this storm system will start to slowly fade away as we move in the overnight hours with perhaps a stray shower lingering on Thursday. Temperatures still fairly much above average, but we're in the 50s. And that'll be the case as we head into Thursday and Friday. At least Friday is looking nice and dry. We will not warm up again until we get to later next week. I'm meteorologist Charlotte Carl. We have another above average day for most of us. A weak front moved through the area in the afternoon, or excuse me, overnight hours. And we will see temperatures again remaining above average, upper 70s in South Florida, 80s in Orlando and Tallahassee, 70s along most of the Gulf Coast. These showers will continue to progress throughout the northeastern part of the area, affecting South Carolina, North Carolina, the mountain area. And then most of us will have cloudy conditions. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck. Michael, chilly across the northern plains, including some light snow showers. And we've got rain across the Ohio Valley moving its way to the east throughout the day today. And then more rain starts to move into Kansas and Missouri heading into the day tomorrow. Even portions of Iowa getting into some of that rain. Now that continues working its way towards the Great Lakes in the Ohio Valley on Friday. And temperatures running just a little bit above normal as we head through the next few days. Good Wednesday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Suchel in our forecast today across the region, starting off with a bit of a chill in Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle, otherwise 50s and 60s elsewhere. Marginal severe weather risk in central North Texas through the afternoon into the evening. And then Thursday, especially late day Thursday into Thursday night, risk to see a few severe storms develop across Texas and Oklahoma. As our next system moves in, we'll see high 60s, 70s to near 80. 
Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Still well below normal for much of the Pacific Northwest and stretching in across parts of Idaho and Montana and Wyoming as well, where we're continuing to get some snow, especially heavy snow in Southern Oregon and Southern Idaho, stretching up even into the across the Rockies. But we've got more rain stretching down, pretty light rain and onshore flow for California for wet weather ahead. That's the scene from here. Desk, America's News Now. On the national desk, America's News Now, migrants ashore, dozens of arrests in Florida as more migrants try to illegally enter the U.S. by boat. Plus, what you are all feeling tonight is what it's like to hit a walk-off home run. Welcome to the California Comeback. Senate shakeup. Voters in California picking a Republican candidate to move on to the next round of the Senate race. Also, November 5th is going to go down as the single most important day in the history of our country. Dropping out, Nikki Haley set to suspend her campaign, paving the way for former President Trump's nomination. Thanks for joining us. You are watching The National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Jan Jeff Cote. It is Wednesday, March 6th, and we do start with that breaking news in the 2024 election cycle. Nikki Haley expected to suspend her campaign. Angela Brown at the live desk with the details that just came out really a few hours ago, Angela, and a lot of folks saying it's about time. Yeah, everybody's talking about this. I mean, she didn't win a lot of contests here. It's breaking this morning that that announcement is expected to come out around 10 a.m. Eastern, that Nikki Haley is dropping out and suspending her campaign. Of course, we'll have an update right here, but this comes after former President Donald Trump dominated Super Tuesday. The former president more than doubled his delegate count. Here he is right here in Mar-a-Lago. You can see him overnight coming out to chance of USA when he walked into this room. Trump addressing a crowd of supporters. Take a listen. Our cities are choking to death. Our states are dying. And frankly, our country is dying. And we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before. Well, Trump did not mention Nikki Haley in that speech, the only other Republican left in the race right now, although once again, we're hearing those reports from the Wall Street Journal, other places that she plans to end it today. We'll hear more about that announcement coming up at 10 a.m. Now, last night, her campaign released this statement. Now, this is last night. Today, in state after state, there remains a large block of Republican primary voters who are expressing deep concerns about Donald Trump. That is not the unity our party needs for success. Addressing those concerns, those voter concerns, will make the Republican Party in America better. At the same time, President Joe Biden also dominated on Super Tuesday, losing only one contest. American Samoa voted for the long shot candidate in the this case, Jason Palmer, but there are signs of division in the Democratic Party. 15% of ballots in Minnesota went to uncommitted, protesting the president's policies in Gaza. Now, we have a breakdown here. Half of the 16 states that held elections yesterday had either uncommitted, no preference, or a write in slot on their balance. So you can see the results back here. Just take a look at North Carolina 85,000 votes in North Carolina, and then you go down to 40,000 Minnesota, all uncommitted people. This comes after the movement really gained a lot of momentum in the Michigan primary, where more than 100,000 took the protest vote, voting uncommitted in that state, John. All right, Angela, thank you so much. This morning, with a likely rematch now between Biden and Trump, many recent polls showing Trump on top if the election were held today. Yesterday, reporters asked the president about the concerns coming from his own party. What's your message to Democrats who are concerned about your poll numbers? My poll numbers, the last five polls you guys don't report, I'm winning five, five in a row. According to the latest polling average from Real Clear Politics, Trump is leading Biden 
48 to 46 percent. That does include 11 polls over the past two weeks. Biden was leading in just three of them. Tomorrow night will be perhaps one of the most significant for Biden's reelection campaign as he delivers the State of the Union address. Biden expected to touch on some of the top issues for voters like the border. House Republicans have invited NYPD officers who were assaulted by migrants as well as the family of Lake and Riley who police say was murdered by an illegal migrant last month. The president also expected to address the conflict in the Middle East. 17 relatives of Israeli Americans still being held hostage by Hamas terrorists will also be at the address. The Republican response will be made by Alabama Senator Katie Britt. She is the youngest Republican woman to be elected to the Senate. This morning, Republicans could be a step closer to taking back control of the Senate now that Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema says she will not seek re-election. The National Desk's Kayla Gaskins joining us live from Capitol Hill. Good morning to you, Kayla. How will this shake up the race in Arizona? Good morning to you. Well, good morning, Jan. So this takes her out of what was shaping up to be an extremely competitive three-way race. She was running as an independent, Carrie Lake running as a Republican, and Ruben Gallego running for the Democrats. Polling, though, had Cinema running far behind both Lake and Gallego, even though she would be a well-known incumbent in the state. Cinema is a polarizing political figure. She's worked on brokering agreements between Democrats and Republicans. When announcing she was stepping down, she said, I believe in my approach, but it's not what America wants right now. This race is also key for determining who controls the Senate. Arizona, very much a swing state. Democrats hold a slim 51 seat majority in the Senate right now, and they're facing some tough races in November in states like Montana and Ohio, both red states with blue senators that are trying to keep their seats. Republicans, however, in November face a much friendlier landscape uh, where they're running in uh, states that went for Trump in 2020. So, Jan, we'll see. Live on uh, Capitol Hill, I'm Kayla Gaskins reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Thanks so much, Kayla. In California, the Senate primary to replace the late Dianne Feinstein down to the top two contenders. The special election will be between Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff and former MLB star Republican Steve Garvey. In California, the two Senate candidates with the most votes, regardless of party, move on to the general election. Your vote was your shared belief with me that California is no longer the heartbeat of America. Sadly, it's just a murmur. That we have challenges to face up to, like closing the border, and responsibilities to live up to, like helping the homeless off the streets and a pathway back to their dignity. And that if we do those things and more, our best days will be ahead of us. Polling released last week from UC Berkeley had Garvey up two points on Schiff, 27 to 25 percent. The American dream of buying a home is still out of reach for millions of families. Home values rising as many Americans still cannot afford to buy. The National Desk's Angela Brown joins us right now. And there's some new numbers, Angela, out on those home values. Good morning to you. And good morning, Jan. The good news for some homeowners who bought homes, if you own a home, it could be worth more. The U.S. housing market saw an enormous jump in value over the past year, and now total market value is about $47.5 trillion. This morning, we're going through a report uh, from Redfin that analyzed over 90 million U.S. residential properties and found the total home value of U.S. homes jumped 5%, the biggest gain in nearly a year. This trend in part due to shortage in homes for sale. If you look at national listings across the U.S., we have 40% fewer listings today than we had in 2019. So if you're trying to shop for a home, don't think that you're going to be flush with options. And we're also going through a recent report from the National Association of Realtors. Year over year, pending home sales were down 8.8% in January, and the home sales shortage is also tied to those mortgage rates, pricing many Americans out. The average mortgage rate on a 30-year mortgage for a median price home was somewhere around $1,900 a month when Trump left office. You know what that number is today? $3,500 a month because those higher interest rates mean a 30-year mortgage is much, much more expensive. That Redfin report says that home values in pricey metro areas and pandemic boom towns are beginning to fall. The total value of homes in urban areas rose around 3.6%, while homes in suburbs saw a 5.6% increase. Now, some economists say as the Fed pivots away from interest rate hikes and mortgage rates continue to decline, home buying could pick up this year. 
All right, Angela, thanks so much. Straight ahead on the national desk, debt dilemma. Taxpayers wasting billions on this number you see right here as Congress prepares to vote on several more spending bills later today. Former White House economic advisor Steve Moore joining us next to break it all down. A recent government report showed income growth for Americans in January was largely driven by an increase in social benefits and taxpayer-funded welfare programs. That new information coming out as Congress gets ready to vote on several bills to fund the federal government before a deadline on Friday. Joining us now, former White House economic advisor Steve Moore. Good morning to you, sir. You call Good it, morning, Jan. <laughs> you call it a short-term high with long-term consequences. Tell us more about this report. Well, look, here we go again, right, Jan, with these ma ma massive spending bills, and Americans are incredibly frustrated by what's going on. You know, there was a new statistic that every 100 days, are you ready for this, Jan? Every 100 days, the federal government is borrowing almost a trillion dollars, and this is just out of control. And I got to say, neither party right now really wants to cut spending. It's it's quite frustrating that, that uh, the uh, spending is not going down. Uh, they're increasing spending on a lot of the programs. There's a big Ukraine bill. Uh, there's a big Israel bill. There's a big a border spending bill on top of all the other things we've got going on. Student loan uh, debt. Uh, Biden wants to spend uh, tens of billions more on that. And that, yet there's no corresponding reduction. So it, I think it's a fiscal calamity. I think most Americans agree that we can't keep doing what we're doing. That's it's why, a train wreck. And that's why I love what your organization did, releasing this humongous billboard, very apropos, uh, in Times Square, showcasing the dangers uh, of reckless spending with a ticking time bomb clock on right. it. Talk about this and, and the reaction that you've received uh, as a result of this. I think we have some video of it as well. Well, it, it is a ticking time bomb. And, you know, everyone knows the debt clock, which is now, you know, when I got started in this business 35 years ago or so, our debt was about uh, one or two trillion. And now it's, it's 34.4 trillion. And by the way, probably by the end of the show, we'll have added another, you know, a uh, couple hundred thousand dollars to the debt. So it, it is something that is like termites in the basement of a house. Eventually, if you continue to allow those termites to keep gnawing at the foundation of the house, it's going to collapse. And I'm, look, I'm not saying we can't turn this around because I really think that we can. But right now, I have to say there's no appetite in the White House or in Congress to cut this spending. Yeah, we're showing the billboard right now. Tell us about this billboard you guys have. What, 50 feet? Middle of Times Square, it says, scared of the national debt. Tell us more about this. What's the, what's the uh, brainchild <laughs> behind it? Yeah, we, well, you know, we're best to raise public uh, awareness of a problem than in Times Square, the most crowded place in the country. Uh, and so that's a 50-foot ad that we're running just saying, you know, you should be concerned about this debt and let's elect people who want to do something about returning fiscal sanity to this country because I think it's one of the number one problems with our, with our country right now. And, you know, we're, we're, the, we're still the number one economy in the world. Uh, we are doing better than most other countries, but we should be doing so much better. And remember, a lot of that borrowing is, you know, with countries like China and Japan and other countries that, uh, you know, we don't want to be borrowing from. President said to give a State of the Union tomorrow yep. night. We know this will be part of his speech. A lot of economists watching closely to see if he frames inflation as some liberal mindsets believe, blaming businesses for it. How dangerous is this, especially when you consider the government wants to control more of what businesses charge instead of just allowing for this free market system? This is going to be a big theme. You're, you're exactly right, Jan. In the, in the speech tonight, the president's going to talk a lot about Greedy businesses are the reason that, you know, prices are high. Do you remember, Jan, about a year ago when the gas prices went to $5 a gallon? He blamed the gas station owners for high gas prices. Now he's uh, he's uh, blaming. The, the new thing is, uh, you know, the Doritos packages are smaller now, uh, and they have less chips in them. Uh, that's the way that, uh, that the companies are saving on costs. And that's called shrinkflation. And it's happening under Biden. So not only are you paying more for things when you go to the grocery store, because grocery prices are up by 22% since Biden came into office, but also, have you noticed this, Jan, that the, you know, the servings at restaurants are smaller. The bags of Doritos have fewer chips in them. You have fewer Oreos in a box of uh, cookies. But, but this is something that we talked about, especially when you do even a wage increase. What 
do they think is going to happen? Corporations are not going to lose. They're going to definitely put that and transfer that to the consumer regardless. Yeah, so consumer, the consumer's getting screwed two ways. Number one, Jan, you're paying more, right, at the grocery store. And number two, what you're bringing home, you're getting less food. So it's it's another form of inflation. And Biden's going to blame that on the companies. But wait a minute, it's not like, why is it just since Joe Biden came into office, uh, companies got greedy? Uh, it's because they're having a hard time. Companies, too, ask any small business. Their costs are way right. up, Jan. They got to pay more for employees, pay more yes. for, for supplies. Yep. I mean, pay more for energy costs. Yes. Um, and very quickly, uh, let's talk about this recent report showing income growth for Americans last month or, or January, largely driven by an increase in some of these taxpayer-funded welfare programs. Well, there's a big, first of all, if you look at just how much people's incomes have gone up versus inflation, in real terms, the average family is still down about $2,000. That, that's not a very good record. Under Trump, by the way, people's incomes were up by about $6,000 after inflation. Um, so that's, that's the real issue here is, yes, your paycheck may be bigger, but it's, is it is is it you know twenty percent higher than it was? Most Americans say no. I think if I were the Biden campaign, I'd be very concerned about these polls showing that about two thirds of voters, Jan, are now saying they think that the country is going in the wrong direction. That's a really bad number if you're running for re-election. All right, White House economic advisor Steve Moore. Always great to see you, sir. Have a great week. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Still ahead this morning, Addicted in America, lawmakers in one state moving to combat the impacts of fentanyl as overdose deaths reach a record high. And breaking here at the live desk, we just got our hands on the new ADP employment report giving us insight into private payrolls across America. Here is that number right here for you. Private employers added 140,000 jobs in February, showing a steady growth for the month, but not a major scale tipper when it comes to the possible Fed rate cuts this year. Now, speaking of those rate cuts, today Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is scheduled to testify on Capitol Hill. He's expected to tell Congress that the central bank is committed to processing cautiously and timing interstate interest rate cuts this year. The House hearing will start at 10 a.m. Then on Thursday at 9.40 a.m., he'll speak with the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. From Washington State residents pushing to stop fentanyl overdoses to an attempted casino robbery caught on camera in Indiana. We are taking the pulse of America. But we start with illegal migrants arrested after reaching Florida's coast. This is video of the moments the Indian River County Sheriff's Office stopped a boat near Sebastian's Inlet last Friday. Inside, they discovered 24 undocumented Haitian migrants on board, including children. Josh, we're going to be just off of y'all, just got here. By Saturday, a second migrant landing, this time at Coral Cove Park in Tequesta. According to the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office, eight more migrants, including children, were discovered. Six were taken into custody. I'm confident that there are boats coming through all the time that we don't catch. Nearly every migrant of these two incidents were from Haiti, a country in despair. Indian River County Sheriff Eric Flowers says he wouldn't be surprised if Florida's coast has an increase of migrants in the weeks to come. The reality is the people that are leaving out of there are in such dire straits that they're so happy to get out of their country. Birds I kind of dove through the window and got into the cage, into the cashier's cage. One of the supervisors, uh, when she first heard the scream, and she was getting on the phone trying to figure out uh, what was going on. James Johnson, an Indiana Gaming Commission investigator, describes in court what went down Saturday at 7.29 p.m. at the Hollywood Casino in Lawrenceburg. And starts demanding money from the tellers who are dealing with the uh, customers, the patrons at the casino. Prosecutor Lynn Denton says Birdseye was in debt. Documents from the Hamilton County Court show two civil lawsuits against him, one for a default on a personal loan for $30,000 and the other from Venmo for $5,700. Birdseye was at the casino as a customer. He had been at the casino earlier in the day, had lost some money, wasn't doing well. They say he had a fully loaded 9mm Ruger, 
two extra magazines, and a bullet was chambered in the handgun, ready to fire. Despite the tens of thousands of people who sought help for drug use in King County last year, the number of fatal overdoses continues to climb, especially involving fentanyl. I think it's a problem that uh, has to be solved. Delivering that treatment is part of an expanded approach county leaders are taking, led by Executive Dow Constantine. While other communities may look at this and see an unsolvable crisis, King County is taking action. A 16-bed residential treatment center is one part of that solution, slated to open later this year. That can help bolster the work of 22 walk-in clinics that connect addicts to short-term help. Mobile clinics will also go to where drug users are to deliver help, and more vending machines dispensing naloxone will put life-saving medications in more people's hands. And coming up, a huge payout for hackers behind a major healthcare ransomware attack causing crippling disruptions to pharmacies across the nation. Details ahead after this quick break. Hackers have disrupted services in the city of Hamilton in Canada for more than a week. Right now, there is no timeline when they could be back up and running. Now, that attack is sparking concerns in nearby cities as well. At the same time, we're learning hackers seemingly got a huge $22 million payday after a ransomware attack that caused major snags at pharmacies across the U.S. We are also learning Tuesday's widespread outages on Facebook, Facebook Messenger, and Instagram were not related to a cyber attack. The company says it was due to a technical error. That outage happened just ahead of Thursday's deadline for big tech companies to comply with the EU's new Digital Markets Act. It's not clear if the outage had anything to do with those preparations. Now that's our time for this hour of the National Desk. Now here's a look at America's weather where you live. I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look the Northeast. We have a warm day in the Northeast. Today, temps are going to surge back into the 50s with a narrow window of sun. There will be some rain over northern New England and parts of New York. Here we are, 7 a.m. Notice that narrow window of sun is uh, closing in during the course of the afternoon. More rain moves in late today through tonight. Flood watches have been issued through southern New England. We should be clearing it out on Thursday. I'm Chief Meteorologist Gerard Jabaley. Here's a look at the Mid-Atlantic region. Tuesday has been fairly wet and Wednesday will be the same. We'll have scattered showers, especially as we move through the afternoon. And then this storm system will start to slowly fade away as we move in the overnight hours with perhaps a stray shower lingering on Thursday. Temperatures still fairly much above average, but we're in the 50s. And that'll be the case as we head into Thursday and Friday. At least Friday is looking nice and dry. We will not warm up again until we get to later next week. I'm meteorologist Charlotte Carr. We have another above average day for most of us. A weak front moved through the area in the afternoon, or excuse me, overnight hours. And we will see temperatures again remaining above average, upper 70s in South Florida, 80s in Orlando and Tallahassee, 70s along most of the Gulf Coast. These showers will continue to progress throughout the northeastern part of the area, affecting South Carolina, North Carolina, the mountain area. And then most of us will have cloudy conditions. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck. Michael, chilly across the northern plains, including some light snow showers. And we've got rain across the Ohio Valley moving its way to the east throughout the day today. And then more rain starts to move into Kansas and Missouri heading into the day tomorrow. Even portions of Iowa getting into some of that rain. Now that continues working its way towards the Great Lakes in the Ohio Valley on Friday. And temperatures running just a little bit above normal as we head through the next few days. Good Wednesday morning to you. Meteorologist Chris Suchel in our forecast today across the region, starting off with a bit of a chill in Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle, otherwise 50s and 60s elsewhere. Marginal severe weather risk in central north Texas through the afternoon into the evening. And then Thursday, especially late day Thursday into Thursday night, risk to see a few severe storms develop across Texas and Oklahoma. As our next system moves in, we'll see high 60s, 70s to near 80.
Good morning, I'm meteorologist Rebecca Stevenson. Here's what's happening across the West. Still well below normal for much of the Pacific Northwest and stretching in across parts of Idaho and Montana and Wyoming as well, where we're continuing to get some snow, especially heavy snow in Southern Oregon and Southern Idaho, stretching up even into the across the Rockies. But we've got more rain stretching down, pretty light rain and onshore flow for California for wet weather ahead. That's the scene from here.